Okay, um, we're in Psalm uh, 43, Judge Me, O God. And uh, this is uh, part B or part two of the last class. So if you didn't get the first class, you won't get it. No, no. If you didn't get the first one, uh, it'd be suggested that you go back and, and listen to the first one because this, this one is simply building on what we've been talking about, which is the difference between civil court and criminal court. <clears throat> and uh, But now I want to take it to another level. And I want to talk about the difference between judge and father. But confusion on the part of a Christian is not just over the difference between a civil court and a criminal court. As a believer, we do not just go to court as a plaintiff, but as a son of God. <clears throat> In a civil case, the judge will stick strictly to the case and to what truly pertains. He does not get into personal issues. He gets into legal issues. Since all that come before him, all the people that come before this judge for, jud for judgment are also his children, then he deals with legal things as a judge, but he deals with family things as a father at a latter time and in a different arena. <clears throat> the judge straightens out the legal issues, and then he deals with all of us as sons, and that's what Hebrews 12:7 says, then he dealeth with us as sons. He's dealing, that means that there is this complete dealing from God, not as judge, but as father. <clears throat> when he deals with sons, he's not the judge, he's father. Proverbs is full of God's instructions as a father. Now, now, I think that's a pretty amazing thing you must consider, that all of that that we think is God talking to us, or all of that that we think is a judge talking to us, is the admonition of a father to a son. Okay? A judge is one who commands obedience to laws and to statutes based on sheer obedience. But the Father has imparted his Son, Jesus, to us, and with it the divine nature. The law says to go one mile, but the Father expects things of us that are far beyond just being law-abiding citizens. Okay? Since it is the Son within us that the Father looks to, then we can use that same Son who is outside of us as examples as to how we should handle Father issues. In Luke 23, this is uh, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, Jesus dealt with his current situation there as a son and forgave instead of moving as a plaintiff who wanted redress or wanted God to take care of the, or the judge to take care of the situation. Father, forgive them. Father, into thy hands. Notice the word father. Notice that he's relating strictly as a son on that cross, not as a plaintiff. It's important. It's important that we see the difference and that we see it literally in the scriptures. But though it is, is easy to run to the judge and ask for vengeance, we call it justice, but sometimes our motive is wrong. Uh, it is not as easy to run or to go to the Father because no man goeth to the Father but by me by union into Christ's nature. No man comes to the Father but by the Son. Okay? <clears throat> the Father wants his Son in us. The Father is the farmer that's looking for the fruit of Christ out of us. This is John 15, 1. For the Father is the, the, farm, the, father is the farmer or the husbandman. Okay? There, that is strictly the father-son relationship, and most of John is that, and much of the other scriptures, if you'll search it out, is more in the realm of sonship. <clears throat> um, in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the father. That's what it says. 
It's not of the Father. It did not say it was not of God or that it broke rules set up by the judge. <clears throat> it says the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> when a wrong turns up, we expect God to immediately come on the scene as judge and to punish, but the Father does not punish. He chastises. <laughs> Vengeance belongs to the judge, but sonship belongs to you. Because you're the son of God. <clears throat> All right. Next subtopic is called fighting fairly. We do not just go to court as a plaintiff, but as a representative of the Father's house and of his spirit. When we have to deal with a disputed area or issue and appeal to the great judge, our Father expects us to fight fairly. <clears throat> it is similar to being a police officer. The criminal, criminal may be able to use wiretaps, automatic weapons, and every advantage is at his disposal, while the police must adhere to strict and restraining ethics that remain legal. Even so, the person we are in court, or, or I'm sorry, even so, the person that we are in court with may lie, they may use deceit, and any number of tactics that, are, that totally violate God, but we are sons in the image of Christ. We must fight fairly. Uh, quoting 2 Timothy 2.5, If a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So that means that if you run a race, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, they're, they're accusing um, Lance Armstrong of using steroids. Well, folks, if he ran a race using, you know, bicycle did, did that, and then it was found that he did, did it on steroids, you don't win, you know. You have to do the thing lawfully or you don't win even if you win. <clears throat> uh, so the police cannot violate the law but we cannot violate Christ and his nature within. We do not get away with what they do. As sons, as sons, we do not get away with what they They may spread slander, but we cannot. They may actively enlist people to their cause using distortions or lies, but we cannot. But that's part of the rub concerning the righteous. We chose to not respond in kind but may become upset because they do not have a conscience that stops them from such actions like we do. Therefore, we conclude that God or somebody should punish them and not just later, but now. And it's easy to, I mean, of course, but there must be something stronger at work in us than just justice. Christ must be stronger than that. But does God many times withhold punishment in the case of all his children? Meaning chastisement, I missed that. Is he not long-suffering? And the answer is, my God, he has been so long-suffering with all of us. <clears throat> is our actual reason for being upset based on the fact that we do not get to do things or get away with the things that they do? <clears throat> so we see from these examples that not only do the ungodly drag hurt feelings into the court proceedings, but also the righteous. <laughs> and it's, it's just a fact. All right, this next topic is called personal injury court. <laughs> so that's a whole different category, right? Civil court, criminal court, personal injury court. There are many that approach court less like a civil court and more like a personal injury court. That kind of court is unknown in the New Testament. However, it is very popular in today's modern world. Making it a personal injury court uh, case happens when the issues at hand are not near as important to the plaintiff as their hurt feelings and bruised pride. Their judgment becomes clouded by their feelings more than by the issues, so they come to court hurt, angry, and looking for vengeance. All right? <clears throat> when we get personally injured, we try to inject that into the court proceedings. 
However, the judge will not allow you to insert those things into the case, into a true court case. When you start making it a thing, of spreading it around and everything, you, you might get away with it. But he won't, he won't allow that as evidence. God is trying the case, not the people. <clears throat> Personal pride and soulish reaction belong to the religious realm and not the civil realm. We'll discuss that in a minute. Provision can be made for dealing with them, but on another basis, in another arena. For example, your heavenly Father expects you to forgive. I mean, the judge doesn't expect you to forgive. The judge will, will judge justly and be on your side. Do you understand what I'm saying here? He won't say forgive. He won't do it, he, especially if it's their fault. You need to hear that because, that because he is just. But he's more than just. He's higher than just. He's father. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> he expects you to go the extra mile. It's not just that God corrects the wrongs done, but when we are tempted to do to them as they did to us, he wants us to take his part. Simple thing. He's not primarily in the business of fixing things. His biblical objective and emphasis is not to become the just judge of the universe, but to have sons in the image of Christ. Because of this, the Father is very concerned with the spirit and manner we carry ourselves within the issues. And again, he'll still be a just judge. He will, he will decide in your favor over the issue. But when you get it all mixed up and, you know, you turn it into, you muddy the water, then he's got to deal with you. <clears throat> all right. So um, God is more righteous than we are, yet consider how he proceeds. He judges the earth but does not have to be angry in the midst of his judgments. To truly stand before the judge as just in civil court in a proper frame of mind we must repent of all anger, malice, and self-will, which things could be used to sway the discussion to go our way. You know, using those. Were you civil in civil court? <laughs> did you fight fair? Or did you knowingly, listen to this, did you knowingly falsify the whole issue? Did you pretend to be angry about one thing when you knew your anger had a, was, had a different and much less presentable cause in court. So you said, this is what I'm really angry about, but it's not. <clears throat> Did you pretend to be hurt over something when envy, vanity, pride, or thwarted self-will? Thwarted self-will, where you shut, it, shut down self-will and it didn't like it because it wanted its way? <clears throat> um, was the real trouble. We may win by cheating, but then we do unfairness to the one we claim was unfair to us. I mean, I mean, I know this is, but we're sons of God, and we're also sons of the judge. These things are important to him. We must not be pharisaical even to the Pharisees. Um, Ephesians 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Remember that while the judge is judging the case, the father is examining concerning conformity to Christ. In Psalm 7, verse 3 through 5, the writer is only in the right concerning the issue at hand. But in verse 8, he declares that he's also innocent of the counter charges and is righteous in that he did not fulfill their accusations. He is sure that what the ungodly has done to himself, he has not done to others in any form. If I have done such, any such thing, Psalm 7 says, their point is that, I'm quoting here, they have rewarded me evil for good. I mean, that kind of stuff gets to the heart of the Father as well as to the judge in that sense. And even after this, I kept on showing love to them. When they were ill, I prayed for them. If we are truly right concerning the issues, then being falsely accused should not stir up self-righteousness, but confidence of our position before the judge, if we're truly right. 
It, it, it doesn't have to stir up self-righteousness. It shouldn't. It shows that there's something else at work in us. Okay. All right, now, next subtopic. Civil court issues reveal our inner selves. The court of public opinion, whoops, that's another court. <laughs> the court of public opinion can sway many a person to act in an unethical manner. What will a person do to appear right to the general public? To what lengths will he go to make others look bad so that he might win? While the judge properly weighs the evidence of the case, the father takes note of our character. He's deeply concerned that not just, uh, he, but not just concerned over wrongs done to us. He's deeply concerned over our character, character because that reflects back on his fatherhood. It also demonstrates the degree to which each son has received the cross, partaken of the resurrection, and conformed to the image of Christ. These are not legal issues to him. They strike at the very heart of all that he has done on Calvary. So just examine that for one minute and consider. These are not requests on the part of the judge for information. This is the father who is examining this. The issues that have initiated the civil court action tend to bring out personal pettiness, vindictiveness, and resentments. A person may appear before the judge as an innocent victim that has been wrongly treated by the defendant their voice and demeanor may exude innocence and weakness to all around. They may plead loudly that they are appalled at the injustice of the other person while maintaining how righteous and upstanding they themselves are. But the eyes of the Father are watching all the proceedings, including those behind the scenes. Remember quoted many times in, in uh, Matthew 6, for the Father who sees in secret, Interesting, it doesn't say for the judge who sees in secret. <clears throat> he sees their motives. Notice that the concept of laying up treasures in verse uh, 17 of, of Matthew 6 there is directly tied not to religious works, but to demonstration of the family spirit. And I don't have time to get into those scriptures, but it's incredible, again, how, how the Lord brings this stuff out. Um, <clears throat> consider Matthew 5. In verses 3 through 9 and 16, this is the Beatitudes. We have the Beatitudes all based on relations with others because you're a son of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let, let your light so shine. These are all quotes from that, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. has nothing to do with judge, judgment and judging and getting the court thing settled. This has all been moved into the arena of the Father. Verses 21 through 26 is dealing with brothers or family issues. If a brother offends you, if a brother does this, if a brother does that. Um, verse 25 shows that if you do not deal with it on a family basis, then all is in danger of it going to court before the judge. <laughs> I, mean, that, I mean, he's saying, look, I'm telling you to deal with this in the family. And what does it also say by Paul? Don't t drag a brother to court. You understand? Deal with this on a family basis issue. Uh, notice verse 38 through 49. Verses 45 and 48 give proof that the base of these particular actions are as a son to their father. And it's just, it's just packed full of it, so I'm not reading all of that. Um, the action called for are very particularly lamb-like actions and attitudes that are usually not required by a judge in a civil court. And this is not civil court material. But he's saying, go the extra mile. But he's saying, you, you see what I'm saying? Um, <clears throat> they have nothing to do with what is just and right as in a court case. It has everything to do with the family spirit. <clears throat> the father sees if they are using the evil done to them as justification for evil actions back. Evil done to me, though, so I do evil back. That's my justification, because they did evil to me. <clears throat> he sees if we are calling the resentment that rises in us a sense of injustice. It's resentment, but we're calling it a sense of injustice. Are we redefining God's terms? Is resentment being disguised as a just and righteous thing? Is hatred being disguised so that people may be punished to satisfy our hatred? 
Some are very subtle, like the serpent, which it's being subtle is the ability to disguise what is truly at work deep within. In a court proceeding, a person may appear as an injured party when they are actually overly upset because of how the crime made them look or feel. That is the real issue with them. There's a fine line between hating evil or hating what is done to us and calling it evil. In that case, all is personal. That's why this was, we were talking about personal injury court. All is personal. All is based on it's not fair to me. <clears throat> In other words, we may do the same thing to someone else and have no compunction of guilt over it because it was not done to us. In other words, when they do it to us, we go, <gasps> I'm shocked. But we do it to someone else and it doesn't even occur to us because we don't have true justice and ju right judgment within us. We are simply partial to ourselves. <clears throat> um, we are not opposed to the, e to the evil, but of it being done to us. When a person's issue against another involves the fact that they were lied to, yet they lie to other people about the case, then what is right is really not the issue with them. The same goes for any subject. There, if they're griping you know, and complaining that they lied to me, but they're running around lying, folks, what's right is not the issue with them. That is not the issue. What, is, what happened to them is the only issue. When we protest loudly that someone, let's see. <clears throat> when we protest loudly that uh, someone did evil to us, but turn around, okay, I did read that. A specific injury by others has become the occasion whereby we show our true colors. We demonstrate a willingness to violate God's laws, commands, his very nature, as if the injury has now allowed such actions as proper. Because they injured me, so I can... That doesn't, that doesn't allow anything in the court. <clears throat> All right, next subtopic. Bef uh, before, you, before you go to court, examine yourselves. To truly be in the right, a person must be willing. <clears throat> you know, I hope I didn't skip a little bit here. I think I'm good. <clears throat> Before you go to court, examine yourself. To, be, to truly be in the right, a person must be willing to deeply examine himself. To do, do that properly, we must ask ourselves many probing questions. What are our reactions truly based on? Okay, now this... This is incredibly important, the part we're getting into here, because uh, the example that, that I've used for years, I think Cassie and I originally came up with the thought of it, is that, uh, you know, on your computer, when you're online and stuff, there's this program called Norton. You put it on there, and what it is is it's, it, it, it blocks uh, malicious uh, software, viruses, uh, spyware, all this kind of stuff, and it's on your computer, but it works in the background. So you're surfing, and it goes, you know, and it pops up a little sign, I just killed three things, I shut down two pop-up windows, I did this, I did that, and all that. <clears throat> what we need to have within us is a Norton. We need to have a program written by God on our heart, which is called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that catches not malicious stuff from out there, but stuff that pops up in us. What's your motive here? Da -da -da -da. It checks through, it goes da 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 da. <clears throat> most people, and this is the absolute truth, most people are not honest enough with themselves. They don't want to examine their self. They want to believe everybody else is wrong. They want to, they always want to pass the blame. Have you ever seen somebody that no matter what you say to them, they have a justification? You did so-and-so, so, well, I had to because this happened right there. Well, you did, you did this over here. Well, yeah, but that's because I was tired. Well, you did this, and you're just going, it's like trying to nail jello to a tree, you know. It's like, this is not working, <clears throat> you know. This is not happening. And yet, no matter what you say, um, <clears throat> uh, my stepfather, uh, 
he was an alcoholic. He was a very hard man. I never, ever, ever heard him say, I'm sorry, or I did something wrong, ever. Not once. Not ever, not once. Okay. <clears throat> and um, I think that we all ought to be willing, <clears throat> if we're wrong, if we've done something, <clears throat> to say, okay, you know what? I did wrong. You know, I always, I used to say a long time ago, just call sin, sin. Why? Why would I say that? Because just, if you just call it sin and you sin, God forgives sin. But if you don't call it sin, but it is sin, then you don't get forgiveness for it and then you're accountable for it. And so just call it sin and get forgiveness and move on. You know, obviously some people don't move on, but God does. You know, I mean, God does. And that's what's important. He's your father. He's the one that you're really in the relationship with. <clears throat> and so somehow I would if I was you I would pray I would pray that the Lord would inbuild a Norton in you and in me that would catch these wrong motives that come up <clears throat> um, something comes up and you go now why am I really angry I mean why I mean you just say that to yourself inside why am I why am I really angry <clears throat> and will we be honest enough to 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 because usually we have mixed motives. Do you understand what I mean? That means some of it may be the Lord. But, you know, the example I gave is, I think, one of the early Star, Star Wars movies. <clears throat> uh, who was the bounty hunter, whatever his name, Boba Fett or something? And uh, 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 they, they ejected a bunch of trash, and he was mixed in with the trash, and he escaped or got out or something, I think. It's been a long time since I saw it. And he went on out, and nobody ever recognized that he had moved forward and left the place and stuff like that. <clears throat> well, you know, a lot of times we have inward things that are hidden within other things. Sometimes good motives that have bad motives mixed in, okay? And even if it's one bad motive or two, that's if we want the Lord, you know, then we, we admit it. You just admit it. I mean, you know, and, um, <clears throat> and I know this is hard. I'm not, uh, there's no judgment in what I'm saying. It's just hard to say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Okay, it's just hard. But for the Lord's sake and, and for the Father's sake that he might get his son. <clears throat> All right, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about questions. And the questions are designed to um, help us be real about what is truly at work in us. And, uh, and if, if, if there's mixed motives in there, you say, okay, this one's the Lord. You divide it out. This one's the Lord. This one's the Lord. This one's the Lord. Okay, oh, this one's questionable. You know what I mean? This one's the Lord. This is good. This was, this, was, uh, this was me, but I was trying to help, you know. This one is something else. And you just, you just look at it. You just examine it, and you say, okay, you know, I, I admit that there are things at work in me, Lord. Because here's, here's the other part to that, and that is a lot of us are so sensitive because we want the Lord so much that we don't want to see we're messed up. Okay, that's part of it, because we really love the Lord, and it's like, I, you know, this will crush me or something like that. And I understand that. I really, really, really do understand that. <clears throat> but, again, God al already knew you had wrong motives. He's not walking by or going, oh, my God, you just brought that out. I didn't realize it, you know. He knows you're a mess. But the thing is, is that you have to realize that, you know, even if you've got some wrong motives in there, the Lord wants you to be right with him. He wants it to be Christ. He wants you walking with him. And so there's no breakdown between you and him. Therefore, you shouldn't break down, you know. <clears throat> One of the reasons we break down is we think more highly of ourselves than we are. And that's, that is it. Because we go, oh, I thought I was doing better. You know, well, first of all, you're, you're always not doing good. If it's you, that's why you have Jesus as life. 
That's why I have Jesus as nature. You're, you're pretty much a mess or you wouldn't have come to Jesus. And you must be a real mess or you wouldn't have come to this place. Birds of a feather. <laughs> mess together. <laughs> I want it known on this video that I'm not drinking Coke, I'm drinking Gatorade. <clears throat> All right. So let's, let's read a few more of these. <clears throat> um, what are our reactions truly based on? Just look at it. On what basis is our reaction to injustice? Because somebody does injustice to us, but are we really reacting to injustice or how it made us look or how it made us feel? Um, on, uh, are they actually reactions to injustice or are they demonstrated for personal reasons? In other words, it's, this has nothing to do with God at all. We're just reacting because of personally this is messing with me. <clears throat> Do we try to excuse our wrong reactions to injury? <clears throat> Do we allow such things as cheating a man, indignation, bitter personal vindictiveness, keeping someone down, unforgiveness, opportunity for oppression, and bitterness towards others to fill our testimony. Of course, you have a testimony when you're in court. Fill our testimony when we're stating our case to others. See, in that case, the issues are not even there. It, it is totally a personal injury case. Totally. But we, we say it's a civil court. We say there's injustice when we're simply reacting to things that hurt our feelings or made us look bad or stopped us from doing something we really wanted to do or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> are we willing, let's see, <clears throat> are we giving back cruelty and injustice at the injustice we suffered from others? Are we willing to take away the innocence of those on the periphery at the expense of turning someone to our side because we want more people on our side so we don't and you say stuff and you just rob them of their innocence you just throw them into a you know it's just terrible do we proceed with brutal ins insensibility and cruelties just so we can be assured that they suffer only because you suffered <clears throat> is that the only reason to make them truly suffer do we set a course and, with malice, plot a path to bring evil and hurt about to the other party? <clears throat> Many times our injustice is nothing more than pride over how we were made to appear. Since we are led to more and more terrible ways of handling the situation, we may conclude that there is nothing just about us, neither in the eyes of the judge nor in the eyes of the Father. <clears throat> All right. So let me try to sum up this, this part. The difference between civil court or the difference between the judge and the father. Our judge, which is God, is a just judge. He will deal with injustice. You can be assured of that. When you go to court, <laughs> make sure that you are proceeding in a just manner yourself. Make sure that when you are in civil court, you're civil. <laughs> make sure that you are dealing with the judge on the proper basis, which is the issues, not the person. Is this, is this making sense? Okay, this is all just dealing with the judge right now. <clears throat> we don't want the case thrown out. We want justice. We want, uh, we, in some cases, we want to be avenged. And when I say in some cases, I mean 
Not that we take vengeance into our hands. But vengeance is okay if God avenges you. Okay? You, and don't, don't cross that over into realms of sonship. On the other hand, the judge is our father. And it's hard for him not to also consider that that's my son sitting there bringing this case. Okay. And so he expects you to fight fairly. You know, we gave the example of the police. And don't you know that that's hard for the police to have to do everything just right to catch criminals, and yet criminals can just do anything they want to? It's got to you know, I've even seen movies on police that went bad because they saw that they were getting the criminals got away with stuff when they caught them and then it got thrown out and stuff like that. Um, since I was using that example, I'll use it again. That's what Darth Vader was trying to do with Luke Skywalker. He's trying to turn him to the dark side. Okay? <laughs> and that's what the devil is trying to do with you. He's trying to get you to react outside of, let me just say it like this, outside of the law, and when I say the law, I don't mean the Ten Commandments. You gotta, I, I'd like it on. Um, if it's an eternal issue that you're caught up in, then the real issue is, are they gonna push you to violate the lamb, and are you gonna let them? Or are you going to see the highest issue is your the government of the lamb and are you going to walk a just path with your father through that situation so down here the struggle is who's right who's wrong even in in if you carry yourself civilly in this earth in that government which is lower than the lamb the issue is going to be did i get my justice was it meted out properly but in eternity the highest courtroom is that of, of the eternal spirit of the lamb and even down in that court the issue is are is that civil matter is that certain situation in the earth that you need to be dealt with in proper order by God going to push you over the edge from the eternal government of the lamb the eternal issue in that situation is, is it going to taint your spirit and move you away from your eternal government of Christ in you. That's in everything down here that has to be a template laid over it in your inner heart. Because that's a, that's a courtroom that stands forever. When I was talking about admitting when you're wrong, well let me let me just admit on one front that there has been uh, a wrong or an overemphasis um, in this sense. The lamb is not to be understood as the only redress or appeal. But the way that I have presented it has only given one door. And that's wrong. For example, for example, because I'm not, this isn't across the board, but it is true in certain things. For example, as I've said, God will always be just and he will judge correctly and rightly and justly. And you don't say, I'm going to go with the lamb and just, you know, not know that you can go that avenue, that you can find justice. Do you understand what I'm saying? That you can find justice over the issue. Okay, am I making that clear? That there is, that God is still judge and he is still just in his judgments in that sense. <clears throat> All right. However, I do want to say that like in Matthew 5 and 6, when he's, he's talking about, you know, settle this thing between your brother lest you have to take it to court, there is many times through the Lamb that we can settle it 
uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and give a couple examples, and and I hope this doesn't just keep muddy in the water for you. But you have to live where you're at, and if you if you're not totally conformed to the Lamb in that way, folks, um, you live where you're at, and there is court of appeal. There is a justice and there is that sort of thing. But the example I'm going to give is that in uh, Corinthians when Paul's talking about, well, I can't believe that a brother would take another brother to court. Right? And his response is, w isn't it better just to be um, defrauded? That you be right. Okay, here's my, here's my thought on that that the attitude in which he's taking him to court is wrong, not just the taking to court. Because he is, he's not going, I, look, I can take you to court because this is a justice matter. He's taking him to court in a wrong way. He's got wrong motives. He's got issues. And so he's saying, look, you know, you're not, you're not right in your approach of this. And so, and I, you know, I believe that. I believe that there are cases where you might take someone to court, literally, physically, do that. But I believe, and, I, and the perfect proof of that is, you know, the laws that we have in this country, many of them are based on the Bible. Did you know that? Many of the laws that we have in place are based on the Bible. And one of them is um, um, bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. <clears throat> And somebody says, well, I don't want to go into bankruptcy. It looks bad. It look, it's this and that and other. Well, you know what? God set up bankruptcy in the Old Covenant. And it was a provision so that they just wouldn't be so poor that they lose everything. And bankruptcy sees to it that you don't just lose everything. You know? And I've had people come to me and say, well, I shouldn't go to court. I shouldn't go to bankruptcy court and stuff. And I said, you know? God made that provision, put it in our law, and then God put us in a country where we could appeal to that. And I think if that's, you know, as long as you're not ripping people off and trying to get away with something, you understand what I'm saying? That there is justice, and there are ways of taking care of us. All right. But God the Father, who is also the judge, is not going to justify self-righteousness in our part by taking someone to court in a wrong spirit with wrong motives. There's no way that he's going to do that. So I'm trying to make it clear that, that, that I believe there is an appeal to the judge that we need to have and that you can walk in the lamb, but it doesn't, it, but it, walking in the lamb does not necessarily, well, let's say, let me just try to, and I'm glad I'm trying to get to say this because I think it's good doesn't mean that there isn't a cry for vengeance. And I gave you two good examples from the scriptures. That you, and when I say vengeance, to be avenged. God, would, God did that for David, and David held that situation with Shammai in his heart his whole life. But he didn't do it in the wrong spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? He didn't, he wasn't messed up. And that's important to see. <clears throat> and so um, there, there is a place for things that maybe the way that I have shared has said you can't have, uh, you, you can't have a desire for vengeance because that wouldn't be the lamb. Anybody listening? Well, let me revise and say you cannot take vengeance into your own hands. That's the lamb. But it's not the lamb to void out a sense of injustice if you heard what I, I described. Many things that people say are a sense of injustice when it's nothing more than pride. Amen? So, so, so make sure our motives are right, then proceed. But um, right down to the end, the, the people under the altar, they're crying out for vengeance. And you know what? God takes it. God deals with stuff. But 
Make sure what's the lamb is the lamb in his proper place, meaning uh, I won't take vengeance and make sure the judge is in his proper place. I will ask for, for him to avenge me. Is, is this making any sense? And um, so I sincerely apologize. The, the clarity is coming more even for me. And I seek the Lord constantly on these issues. But I know that um, I know that I have, um, uh, that I see the sun and I see the lamb clearly, regularly, a lot. <laughs> okay. And sometimes in my putting that forward, uh, I don't cover all the other bases. And I admit it. And I ask your forgiveness. But I believe, <clears throat> you know, you've heard me say this, and this isn't word, this is me. I would rather err on the side of love and mercy than I would on the side of judgment. You know, I mean, it's the, the picture I keep getting is if I stand before God, I want him to, you know, I'd rather him say, you know, you... You stupid thing, you kept erring on the side of love and mercy. I'd rather hear that than you kept being mean to people, you know what I mean, and go, you know, going too far with it. <clears throat> All right. But even in making that statement, that's not that's not necessarily scriptural. And and it doesn't void out what we've been talking about here. That's what I want to get across. That we can live the Lamb and still have justice. Okay? I mean, it's that simple. It's that short of a phrase, but that's, that's a fact. Anybody else have a comment or something that could, that, that could also help as we close out here? Nisi? Yeah. Just a point on the whole admitting when we're wrong or owning it. Um, coming from, I'm not an expert, but I'm wrong a lot, so <laughs> I'm practiced in saying I'm sorry. And that is, it's so liberating to get that stuff out and over with, because if you're not used to admitting it and you're afraid of looking at what's inside, so you never do, you're carrying a burden around with you that not even the life of Christ could really carry. And when those things come to the surface and you say, I'm wrong, please forgive me, it doesn't just deal with that issue then. It can actually clean you out of that whole problem. And it's so good to have that stuff out, and it's so freeing, and then you can just go on in Jesus and never have to worry about it again. So not only is it glorifying to the Father, but it puts us in a place of being able to walk in the lightness of the grace of God that can't be as long as we're just holding on to our own personal righteousness because we weren't built to be able to carry that burden. So... Forgiveness is a great thing. <laughs> Amen. Did you have something, Nice? Okay. Anybody else? All righty. Well, I just so hope and pray that this, this, the Lord has been able to communicate something here. And if I, um, <clears throat> if I can, I will, um, I was thinking about sticking this in my newsletter or something so that people could study it and go over it and I've got a lot of scriptures I didn't read so I'll see I'll, I'll try to get this to you if you want a copy of it uh, somehow or another in, in the future okay father we just ask you to continue to impress us with the broad realities of, of your order and your ways and Lord to keep us humble and broken before you so that we can hear, hear clearly Lord, I pray that you'll continually deal with me and help me to feed the sheep properly. Feed them, Lord, and, and strengthen them and not be a hindrance to them and not, Lord, in, in some ways, Lord, in some ways actually be an oppressor when that was never my spirit. But, Lord, to give them things that, as Mallory said, are liberating and freeing. So, Father, I pray that uh, you'll continue to speak to us. Lord, the, this subject here, I pray that, um, that all of our people in this fellowship will 
grow up into these things that we will will not just hear it or not just sort of sort of acknowledge it during two classes but that we can get it in us and our our judgments will be in line with your judgments and our spirit will be in line with your spirit so father we ask you to move and to keep us flowing into the fullness of this river of christ in jesus name